So welcome everybody uh, in the name of the East Asia program. Thanks very much for coming to our fifth annual Hushi uh, Distinguished Lecture. And um, I'm just here to introduce our uh, introducer. Uh, <laughs> and so I will pass the word to Professor Dan Boucher from the Department of Asian Studies, who will introduce you to our speaker today. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a really great honor and pleasure for me to introduce my former teacher and now my dear friend and colleague, Victor Mayer. Uh, if I were to give you a full introduction today, we would take up all the time allotted for his lecture uh, because Victor's accomplishments are legion and uh, they, they, are, um, they, they are very, very difficult to encapsulate. Uh, Victor did his PhD uh, in Chinese literature at Harvard University in 1976 and very soon after joined the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania where he still is. Uh, he was then in a department known as the Department of Oriental Studies uh, that is now uh, the Department of East Asia Language and Civilization. Uh, Victor very soon distinguished himself as the preeminent scholar of Buddhist literature discovered at Dunhuang, uh, an oasis city on the western reaches of the Chinese Empire. And a particular focus of Victor's work, uh, especially early on, was on detailing the emergence of a literary vernacular in documents dating from the Tang Dynasty and the ways in which these documents were used in performative context. This led to a series of articles and book projects, most notably three monographs in the 1980s, Dunhuang Popular Narratives, Painting and Performance, Chinese Picture Recitation in its Indian Genesis, and Tang Transformation Texts, a study of Buddhist contributions to the rise of vernacular fiction and drama in China. Victor, Victor's interest in literature, of course, have extended well beyond Dunhuang and Buddhism. He has produced beautifully elegant translations of the Laozi and the Zhuangzi, the latter almost uniquely capturing the playfulness of this fourth century BC Taoist mystic. And as many of you know, both faculty and students, Victor has also produced the now famous Columbia anthologies of Chinese literature, covering all genres, <clears throat> high and low, from the Shang dynasty to contemporary times, from poetry and inscriptions to folk ballads and novels. One of the first articles I read by Victor, <clears throat> which happened to be the very first issue of the periodical he founded, the Sinoplatonic Papers, was on the need for an alphabetically arranged dictionary of Chinese, something that people working in other fields have long had, but Chinese scholars had not. And this became the impetus, in many ways, for a series of ABC Chinese English dictionaries published by the University of Hawaii Press in collaboration with John DeFrancis and now includes resources both for Mandarin and for various historical periods of Chinese language. But perhaps Victor's deepest intellectual passion over the years has, has manifest in his efforts to show how China has been connected to the rest of Asia from the beginning. And here is where Victor the polymath has, has most shown. He has collaborated with internationally renowned scholars in historical linguistics, in archeology, span in art history, epigraphy, paleogenetics, the history of textiles and other aspects of material culture, <clears throat> all in an effort to show that China and Chinese culture were never hermet hermetically sealed from the outside world. Victor has attacked this problem from multiple angles, whether it is in tracing Bronze Age connections in Central Asia or discerning how red-haired mummies ended up on the western periphery of the ancient Chinese kingdoms or in demonstrating how a Persian word for magician came to be inscribed on an 8th century BC artifact. In all of this, Victor has repeatedly and painstakingly interrogated the ways in which Chinese literary and historical traditions have both revealed and masked the close proximity of others and otherness. In addition to his prolific publication output, numbering more than 20 books and, and hundreds of articles in language blogs, Victor has been an active editor on multiple publication series dedicated to China. And these include Encounters with Asia through the University of Pennsylvania Press, the Cambria Sinophone World Series through Cambria Press, the ABC Chinese Dictionary Series through the University of Hawaii Press, and Sinoplatonic Papers, which he has single-handedly published for more than 30 years. <clears throat> Finally, I cannot fail to mention that despite Victor's Herculean research and publication commitments, he has never failed to be a dedicated and compassionate teacher. I have very fond memories of seminars with Victor in the early 1990s when he would routinely show up each week carrying a big stack of Xeroxes, 
uh, into his seminar. And each, he knew what each of his students was working on, the kind of project we had earmarked for the seminar uh, that semester. And he, in the course of his reading, would find a relevant article for us. And he would just start distributing these around the room every week. Um, and sometimes distributing hundreds of pages of text to us. <clears throat> his own scholarly peregrinations took him far and wide. And it was impossible as a student uh, not to be touched and sometimes a little bit intimidated by Victor's passion a passion that shows no signs of subsiding anytime soon. Victor is going to speak to us today on a topic that could not be any more appropriate for the Hu Shu Distinguished Lecture Series, an important Dunhuang manuscript formerly in the possession of Hu Shu. So please join me in welcoming Professor Victor H. Mayer. OK, thanks, Dan. It's a special honor to be here at um, Cornell because this is where I did my earliest research on Dunhuang manuscripts. Uh, I actually literally camped out in, some, in the woods around here. I came up several summers. Why did I come to Cornell? Because um, Cornell was the first, I don't know, maybe the only place that had all 60 or 70,000 manuscripts on microfilm. I think maybe it was Zulin who was responsible for getting them here, but it was sure nice. And it meant that I could come up here and look at all of the Dunhuang manuscripts. And I was very stubborn. I said, I'm going to read every single one. I mean, I didn't read them from begin to ending, but I looked at every single one of those 60, 70,000 Dunhuang manuscripts because I wanted to see um, any evidence of vernacular, uh, writing, popular, uh, popular organizations that would have fostered the development of vernacular. And it was very gratifying. So I, I love Cornell. It's a beautiful place. And it's good to be back. Um, so I, I first should say a few thank yous. <laughs> Thanks to Dan for inviting me and also Thanks to um, Amala Lane and to uh, Daniel Bass and to Josh Young. There he is. Okay, they, they were all very nice in setting up. This was actually a very complicated trip to set up because I'm doing three things on one trip, uh, as Amala kind of indicated. Um, I'm giving this lecture and I'm uh, participating in the Chinese classical Chinese colloquium tomorrow. And then on s Friday and Saturday, no, Saturday and Sunday, Friday and Saturday, also a tea, uh, a very big tea uh, symposium. So we could say, in Chinese we say, yi ju liang de. This is, kill two birds with one stone. I'm killing three birds with one stone. Yi ju san de. And I, it's, it's kind of amazing, and I still have time to run up to Lake Cayuga, which I wanted to, Cayuga Lake, uh, and see maybe where I camped out 40 years ago. <laughs> um, but it's a particular honor to uh, deliver this um, Husher Distinguished Lecture because uh, Husher has been one of my greatest idols from the very beginning of my sinological career. Uh, I would say Husher and Paul Pelliot are my two greatest idols. I have maybe half a dozen others, but Husher is definitely one of them. And it's great to be here where he spent time. And um, I, I admire him so much for many, many things he did, but most of all for his championing of the vernacular uh, by Juan Wentz Register, for example. And um, so he also was very involved in Wu uh, Yundong, you know, with writing. I still remember a vernacular poem by him that I recited in Taiwan long, long ago in a Chinese poetry contest, a uh, Chinese speech contest. And I still remember this line from uh, a poem of Hu Shi about uh, a bird in a cage, Lung Niao. And I remember 
I had, I, I put on a, uh, I said it was a Zhong San Zhuang, not a Mao Zhuang, but it was blue, which was the wrong color, I guess, at that time. This was back in 70, 71. So I said, on TV, in all of front of Taiwan, I said, Wayao Chu Lai. You know, I want to come out of this very vernacular line. I want to come out of this cage. That's the bird speaking. <laughs> okay. So that night, they, the judges, they, they ranked me like the worst. <laughs> because they said I was too dramatic. In Chinese, when they recite poetry, are not supposed to be dramatic. But also, I know that they were annoyed that I was wearing a Mao suit. And I didn't mean it that way. I meant to be... <laughs> Meant it to be a Zhong Shan Zhuang, you know, Sun Yat Sen suit. So there, there is a, another, well, it's in here. Um, I, I was, uh, I had an obsession with one particular Dunhuang story. And there were six manuscripts of it. The main manuscript is in this box, uh, a facsimile, a very rare facsimile. And um, it's a story about Shariputra and the subjugation of six heretics, which I'll tell you about in some detail later on. So this particular manuscript, which is Paleo Manuscript 4524, it's the only uh, Dunhuang vernacular manuscripts that is illustrated that actually the illustrations survive. It's just a miracle we have it because, because we have that particular manuscript, that one, <laughs> 4524. Uh, it, it unravels so many mysteries about the development of uh, chi uh, Chinese fiction and drama that we know from the very beginning that illustrations, pictures were an essential part. Um, and I'll give you some examples of how that uh, continued on later in Chinese literary history. So we had this, by, by, by a miracle, we still have this one manuscript with pictures on the front and uh, verse on the back. And I'll tell you that the verse really doesn't matter to the performer. So a performer would stand with the pictures on a scroll, on the street, and uh, they were usually women, almost all were women. In fact, my evidence shows that all these performers were women. Um, and some of the other manuscripts say, for example, say a tale of Mulian uh, rescuing his mother from hell. That's another very famous uh, Bianwen. <coughs> and and then it would say at the bottom of the title, it would say, with pictures. But the with pictures was crossed out. They lost the pictures somehow. Uh, so the pictures in the text would be separate. And the text was important only for people who, it's probably going to fall off again anyway. I'm not going to worry about it. OK. Um, so we know that this, uh, th this uh, particular genre of literature, which is so important for the history of the development of Chinese fiction and drama, uh, that uh, it, it necessitated the use of pictures. Uh, I better put some of these, these terms down first. So. Um, I'm talking about Ben Wen, okay? I, I'm, I guess that probably 90% of the people in the room know Chinese characters. For the other 10% who may not know, mea culpa, I'm sorry. But this means transformation, and this means text. So these are called transformation texts. And, um, I'll tell you in a moment what a transformation is in relation to pictures. So we also have, the, if we have transformations on the wall of a cave temple, for example, it will be called bian xiang. That's, that's, I call this tableau. 
transformation tableau. So what is a transformation? Oh, now the room is filled up. <laughs> uh, what is a transformation? We could say it is shandian. This is a very Buddhist term, a miraculous transformation. And by the time I'm done with this lecture, I hope you have a sense of what a miraculous transformation is. If you don't know Buddhist epistemology, if you don't know Buddhist um, ideas about the nature of the world, it's very hard to understand exactly what a bien is and what a shan bien is. But this is what this, this is called bien wen, and this is, uh, you could say it's the, the foundation of Chinese vernacular fiction and drama. The first extended vernacular narratives found by chance in a cave in Dunhuang. If, if we didn't find those manuscripts, I'm telling you, we would not know the true history of the, nat uh, true history of the nature of the development of Chinese fiction and drama. These manuscripts just totally transformed uh, our understanding of how fiction and drama developed in China. So I had this obsession with this particular one, which has the illustrations on the front and the poetry on the back. And I knew that there were six manuscripts uh, because the very RM edition in, uh, by Wang Zhongming and other scholars said, there's this manuscript in a Stein collection in British Library, and this manuscript in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, and then there's a Husher manuscript, but nobody knew where it was. Uh, and so I was, I'm very compulsive. If, if I know something's out there, I'm going to track it down. And I don't know how I figured it out. Uh, but, you know, literally nobody knew where this manuscript was, but it, it was said that Husher owned it. And it was, it's called the Husher Manuscript. And somehow or other, I tracked it down to the Library of Congress, United States America, of America Library of Congress. And it was... I don't know if the manuscript itself was there when I found out that they had it at one time, but through a long process of negotiation, uh, I found out that they had magnificent photographs of that manuscript, and they're here. I, I got a whole set of the uh, photographs of that Husher manuscript, and it was very important for me because I couldn't find it's very necessary for correct readings of the Shariputra transformation text. All right, that's all that by way of background. Why, why who sure? Why, why I came up to Cornell <laughs> so often. Now, when I look at um, a map, well, if I look at Eurasia, from space, which I love to do. I, I, I begin most of my lectures with this, because that's how I, I don't just look at China. I think I'm always deceiving myself and my audiences if I only talk about Chinese things by talking about China itself. China was very, as Dan said, I, I really appreciated his uh, introduction. China was open to, in mean, this way too, to the world from, I mean, this way, we call it the Silk Road, right? But we could call it the Glass Road or the Bronze Road uh, or the Spice Road. A lot of things traveled along this way. Uh, and the bron Bronze was coming into China from uh, the West, um, third millennium BC. It was heading this way. So, you know, it's that word, uh, Silk Road, it's a misnomer. And it's, it was never used in antiquity. It was, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it was invented by a German in the late 19th century. And he called it Die Seidenstrasse. And the, the guy who invented that name was 
If you read Snoopy, it was the Red Baron's uncle. <laughs> you know, the Red Baron was the best pilot in World War I. Even the, the enemy rec recognized that the Red Baron was the very best pilot. And his, I think his uncle, I don't know the exact relationship. Um, so Red Baron was called, uh, I think, Manfred von Richthofen. And his uncle was another von Richthofen who was a geographer who discovered things, and especially this range, which is called the Richthofen Range. Uh, in Chinese, it's the Chilean Shan. So he's the one who dreamed up the name Silk Road. And, you know, it's very exotic and everybody loves it. You know, Sicho Jilu, Shiru Kurodo. It just sounds so nice. Uh, it, but it's, it's false. It's a, it's a modern name. Because Silk definitely was not the only thing and probably not even not even the most important thing that traveled along there. So I look, you know, I look at this map of Eurasia, this picture of Eurasia, and I, well, the first thing I always look at is this. That's the Tarim Basin. And in that sits the Taklamakan Desert. Uh, that Taklamakan Desert is one of the hottest, coldest, driest places on Earth. In summer, it's often getting up to 40 degrees Fahrenheit or more. And in winter, it goes down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, or, I'm sorry, Celsius, or less. Um, so actually, the, you know, the mummies I worked on, they were preserved because of the nature of the climate there, which are very, very cold in winter. So if you die in winter, you're likely to become a mummy. And you, especially if you die in very salty soils, you'll become a jerky mummy, <laughs> human jerky. I mean, the, the chances of preservation are very good. And, and I think when I die, I'm going to go out there, but I've got to wait till <laughs> January or February. And I won't need cryogenics. You know, I'll just, it'll be natural. Um, it also is very good for preserving cl clothing. But it's also good for preserving manuscripts. That's why early Sanskrit manuscripts and manuscripts in many other languages are found here, especially in a place called Turfan, Turpan, which is the second lowest place on Earth. And everybody knows the first lowest place on Earth is the Dead Sea. So Turpan, right there in the middle of Eurasia, is the second lowest, almost as low as the Dead Sea. Well, you can see, you just look. This area is surrounded by mountains. So that's why it's so dry, because no moisture can get in from the oceans. And it's very far away from any ocean anyway. But with these highest mountains in the world, the Pamirs, Tenshan, and of course the Himalayas, um, it's just very hard for a drop of water to get in there. And by the way, this, this is India, right? So guess what? India is crashing up against Asia. India came from Africa. Did you know that? India floated across the ocean 50 million years ago and smashed up against, and it's still smashing up. That's why Mount Everest is still growing because this is banging up against here. So that the configuration uh, 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 accounts for preservation of human bodies, manuscripts, clothing, and uh, bodies, everything, anything organic, very well. So it, at Turpan, we have like 20 different languages preserved, including some languages of Iranian peoples. We also have some of them here. Uh, Sogdian and Khotanese, for example. Uh, but we, there's one very special language from the northern rim called Tokarian. How many people in this room have heard of the language called Tokarian? Dan has. <laughs> okay. 
It's very, very important, even though we only know about it from the manuscripts that were discovered here within the last century or so. And it's especially important because it is a Northwest European language. You know, it's linguistically it's closest to languages from up here. But there it was, definitely by the Han Dynasty, because the word for lion, for example, comes from Tocharian. And the word for honey comes from Tocharian, already in the Han Dynasty. So somehow or other, well, I have my theories, and I've written books about it, and long articles, you know, like how they got over there, uh, and how early they got over there. So we have Middle Iranian, we have Tocharian, we have... Hebrew, we have a lot of Persian, um, all preserved in that uh, part of the world. So the, the, the Silk Road, oh, the second thing I look at when I see this whole business is right there. That is the Ordos, the, the great loop of the Yellow River. It's so strange. You know, why the river decided to go <laughs> And I, in Chinese, they, they actually call it he tao, which means like loop or lasso. I call it the lasso that lassoed part of the step and brought it into the zone. Uh, uh, but it's still a desert. The Great Wall was built right up through there. And um, to try to keep the northern peoples from coming in to China. So th this is the Gansu Corridor, the Hushi Corridor. I'll be talking a lot about it in a moment. Gansu Corridor or Hushi Zolang. And about 500 kilometers long. And you go out through there. And then there's the Jade Gate. And, and then the Silk Road splits into a northern and a southern. And then there's also a, one that goes across the step, the step road. Well, Xi Jinping has his Yi Dai Lu. And, you know, he's resurrecting the Silk Road. Uh, good for China. It means business. It means power. Uh, but he definitely has an idea of how important this route was across Asia. And then you go down into India. And why do you want to go to India? Well, India had a lot of good stuff, too, including original Buddhist manuscripts. Because China... Chinese Buddhists, they wanted original texts. The Indian masters would come to China and they would say, I'm a specialist in this or that sutra. And the Chinese say, great, where's the text? It's like, where's the beef? And they would say, here. And the Chinese say, produce it, write it. And they didn't, they couldn't. Because it's, to them it was something you memorized and you spoke. And Professor Boucher is a, a grand master of the early translation of these texts that were coming to China from India. So now I'm going to talk about the most famous of the pilgrims who I always spend too much time with preliminaries. But then I talk fast. Did it go? Yeah. OK. So the most famous of the pilgrims was Xuanzang, right? You, you've all heard of Xuanzang. And everybody thinks that guy is Xuanzang. And for all intents and purposes, for all Chinese, that is Xuanzang. Um, it's important. He, he went to India to get manuscripts. And also, he's very important for the development of the journey to the West, COG because the journey to the West is a fictional rendition of his trip to India. So he's a very important man. And he's also the guy who probably forged the Heart Sutra, which is probably the most important sutra in East Asia. But he, he did a tricky thing. He back translated it from Chinese and made up the Sanskrit. Very clever move on Xuanzang's part. But there he is. Uh, and he's supposed to be like going off to India and getting, uh-oh, I'm not supposed to walk over here. I, I got to control myself. OK. Um, 
But you see, he's got scrolls there, right? If he's coming back from India, he's not going to be having scrolls. He's going to have what, Professor Boucher? Pat palm leaves. Palm leaves. <laughs> yeah, he'll have palm leaf manuscripts. So that's one strike against that being Xuanzang. Uh, he's got his sensor there. Okay, now this, don't they look similar in terms of their iconography? These two guys? I think he has a, some, a, a sensor hanging down. He has a lion. I mean, in some of the versions like this, I don't know if you, can you see a lion there? No. He has it? No. Or a tiger, tiger. No. I, I think it's lurking in the background somewhere. <laughs> uh, but iconographically, they're the same person, the same figure. And he's got a backpack. Okay, so that guy is definitely a Dabiza. And very long nose, you know, very long nose and deep set eyes. Uh, he's a Caucasian. He's got his fly whisk, and Xuanzang's got a fly whisk, doesn't he, there somewhere? Okay, so they're, they're essentially, iconographically, they're the same person, the same figure. But that guy is definitely a Caucasian. So who is he? Well, he's got scrolls, but notice how the scrolls are wrapped up in batches of six or so. Uh, I will later say that that would be the amount for a full storytelling set. So I hypothesize that this man was a wandering storyteller. And this is called a Dhyani Buddha. Anybody here do Buddhist art, East Asian Buddhist art? Anyway, that, a Dhyani Buddha is like a Buddha of inspiration. And he's floating on a cloud. Bear, remember that. Try to engrave that in your memory. Floating on a crowd in front of, cloud in front of this man. Okay, got to move. You all either know one or the other of these guys. You, most of you know this one, Sun Wukong, right? And he can fly through the air. And he's the guy who led Xuanzang to India, or protected him on the way, because Xuanzang was a bumbling fool. <laughs> and he's very clever, and he, he scouted things out. And he's, look, he's got his cudgel, his staff. He's got a staff like that. And they're both monkeys, of course. And his name even means monkey. Sun Wukong means the monkey who is enlightened to emptiness, Wukong. And that's Hanumat, who is the hero of uh, the Ramayana. I wrote a paper for a conference at Academia Sinica probably about 30 years ago, in which I, it was a 100 page paper, and it had 100 or more parallels between him and him. I'm not, I'm not giving a lecture about that now. I'm just telling you that he's from India. He's from China. He was going to India to take Xuanzang there so Xuanzang could get Buddhist manuscripts. Now we're going to walk the way Xuanzang did. And I really am going to speed up. Yep. Okay, so here's the pathway out to Central Asia. Uh, from down here would be uh, Chang'an or Xi'an. And I told you a split. There's Dunhuang where the manuscripts, where these manuscripts came from, Dunhuang Caves. Uh, a lot of different languages are preserved there too. And then this is where the Tokarians, the center of Tokarians were. So we go around the Tarim Basin. There are sites all around here with mummies and different kind of precious treasures. Another, to, to orient yourself, uh, more maps, detailed maps, so you get an idea of where everything is in relation to China, which is, there's China and all this is out here. 
And so I mentioned uh, Tocharian, this very important language, which is related to Northwest European languages. Uh, and this is a very precious manuscript. Most Tocharian manuscripts are just little fragments, tiny fragments. This is one of the more complete ones, but you can see it's, it's uh, lacking some lines, fragmented, but most of them are just like little bits. Uh, this is in a script called Northern Brahmi, an Indian script. Uh, these, these manuscripts date from around 6th, 7th, 8th century Tocharian. And I hope when you all leave this room, you will never for the rest of your life forget the word Tocharian. Okay? Victor Mayer taught me Tocharian. He taught me about the Tocharians. It's super important. And if you ever have any doubt about that, send me an email and I'll give you a lot of references. All right. So th this is, now we're getting into illustrations. And I want you, oh, I've got to restrain myself. Uh, I want you to look at the end of, these are called cartouches. This is an illustrated Buddhist sutra, a page from it. Uh, so these cartouches all end with the character chu. It's a, it's a form you may not recognize, but it's place, Japanese tokoro. So, the, and it, they start usually, well, like, let's take this one. Oh, I can see it right here. Huh. Okay. Tsuren ming zhong de jian fo chu. Can you see it? Tsuren ming zhong de jian fo chu. I'll translate it for you. Usually I try to coax it out of the audience. Nobody ever gets it, what it means. So basically, because I'm in a hurry, it means this is where the, this is the place where the man, uh, th this is the place where the man at the end of his life gets to see the Buddha. So it's a place. This is the place. So remember that when I go into the rest of my talk. Place, the concept, I call this narrative locus. A locus, a place in a narrative. We also have some texts that say this is the time, sure, when such and such happened. I call that narrative moment. So we have narrative locus and narrative moment. Uh, when we look at the Husher manuscript, I'll show you the a parallel usage of that chu with a very vernacular grammatical construction. Okay, here, here's the Paleo 4524 manuscript. Um, so in the first, okay, there are six scenes in the surviving fragmented scroll. You can see it's all torn here. Uh, it was used a lot for performance. That's why it's torn, torn away. But there would have been other scenes back this way. And there were scenes beyond the end of this one. I'll take you to the end of this scroll, but it's not the end of the story. But this is the only scroll we have with pictures on the front and these verses on the back. And I'm, I'm sure that the ladies, the women who told these stories were illiterate and they would not be able to read that. Uh, those only mark uh, divisions in the narrative, like the scene. They mark that where a new scene begins. Because th these uh, passages are in rather more, just as in Peking opera, you know, you, you're, the uh, sung portions are more classical, right? And the spoken portions are more vernacular. Same way in all of Chinese performing arts. So these, this is more classical. I'm sure the ladies who performed these could not read it. So this is a color version of it. it uh, the first scene shows, well, I have to tell you the story very quickly. So the Buddha asks Shariputra, one of his most important disciples, to supervi supervise the construction of the Jetavana Vihara, 
which means the park of Prince Jeta, to make it into a monastery for the monks. Um, Anatta Pindaka, who is uh, Anatta Pindaka, Pindaka, who was a wealthy elder, bought the park, the land from the prince, and donated it, ceded it to the Buddha for the use as a monastery. But the heretics, these guys, the bad guys, Shariputra will be sitting over here, but he's torn off in this scene. So these bad guys, they protested. They're basically Brahmins. And you can see they look very Indian. Okay, uh, the Brahmins were Indians. <laughs> Uh, but they're the heretics, and their leader is called Rodraksha. So they, they objected and say, we, you cannot give this important land to the Buddhists, because the Buddhists, they're the heretics. <laughs> you know, the Buddhists were the upstarts. They're the people that I, I call, you know, in terms of Hindu religion, they would be Jung, and Shariputra would be Xie, you know, Jung, Xie, heretics, heretical. But from the Buddhist point of view in China, those guys were heretics. So uh, they, they protested and said, we're smarter than Shariputra. We're smarter than the uh, Buddhists. We know more. Our wisdom is greater. Let's have a contest and we'll show you how much more superior we, how more, how more superior we are than, uh, than the Buddhists. The Hindus are saying this. So they have a contest in the, well, let's go to the king. Oh, the first scene is, this is a Vajrapani demolishing a mountain. The mountain was created by them, the heretics, okay? First the heretics create this. And then Shariputra creates this Vajrapani, this warrior. And he smashes it to bits with his adamantine mace. Okay. Uh, so how do they produce these things? This is key. This is key. They produce them through shen bian, miraculous transformation, mental powers. That pr it's like a movie camera projecting something in front of your, in front of your eyes. That's what, that's what they did. And you don't believe it, but they believed it. And the king believes it. So uh, the story is that. And the story in Buddhist minds, well, in the, anybody who saw the scroll would believe that it's real. So they pro project through supernatural transformation from, with their mind power, they project that. Shariputra projects this. Are you base, kind of basically following me? Okay, thank you. And there's the king, it says king on his head, on his crown, and he's watching. And then um, if the, whoever wins, they beat a drum or a gong, like, like an, an inning in a baseball game. Uh, so the heretics lost one. And then you see some of the people in the, uh, the king's entourage are starting to look this way. That's very important for narrative flow, okay? Because this scene is, well, it's, it looks like it's static, right? It's painted, it's static. But this kind of gives motion to move us forward to the next scene. You agree, don't you? <laughs> uh, so the king is saying, all right, Shariputra got the first, uh, wins that one. Okay, now we move on to the next scene. Well, now you get to see Shariputra, this great disciple of the Buddha. And he's got mostly Chinese-looking people with him. That's wrong. Historically, it should, they should all look like Indians too because they were all Indians. But the painter must have been a Chinese out there at Dunhuang. So he painted all these good guys to look like Chinese. But there are some weird alien looking types, horns coming out of his head. And that's a very Central Asian kind of helmet. 
But mostly, well, that guy looks like um, one of Buddha's most original, most important disciples. He, he could be a foreigner. He has a very long nose, doesn't he? Yeah. Okay, so they're all nice and regular looking. Oh, but so important. What's up there? Remember, I call it a Dhyani Buddha. It's a Buddha of inspiration. So this guy, it's so key for my uh, argument about that iconographical form of Xuanzang, the Ur iconographical form, because it's the same figure. A, a Dhyani Buddha floating on a cloud to give him inspiration to make really good transformations. This is all stuff that I explain. There's no textbook to explain this. It's stuff I figured out. Oh, this is so wonderful. So this is the uh, next scene. Uh, well, it's obvious what happened. You know, the 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 shot the the heretics made this water buffalo, this big buffalo. Shariputra creates this lion with a flamboyant tail, and he chews him up, blood, gore, dripping. Now, there's a French scholar named Nathalie Monet who has traced this exact motif all across Eurasia. It's incredible, her, her research. I'm, I'm begging her to publish it in Sinoplatonic papers. It's so stunning what she has done. It, it's, I saw her give a lecture on this at uh, the Getty Museum a couple years ago. And you know, the, her research shows even the blood dripping, the, the placement of the teeth, the claw, it's all the same from Mesopotamia to China and even up into Europe. So that's how motifs travel, art travels, ideas travel. Her, her, if I ever get her to publish her paper, it will be absolutely phenomenal. Okay, are they beating the drum? They lost, and even, the, even some of the heretics are looking this way. They're, they know they lost this one. The king, the miswritten king there, uh, looks like a Neo almost. Uh, I think there were multiple artists involved in making this because they, their brushwork, the brushwork, the way they make people look are different. Uh, going on to the next scene. Okay, this is like a marker between different scenes. It's like a proscenium on a stage. There's one side of the stage, there's another side, and there's a tree on either side to tell you this is a scene. There's our little Danny Buddha up there. Okay, I'll, I'll just say very quickly, in this one, the heretics make a beautiful pond with lotuses growing out of it. But Shariputra makes a, a six-tusked white elephant. You can see the six tusks, and he sucks it dry. So Shariputra always wins. He's so powerful, so capable. Okay, you win another one. There's another tree border. And when you have a big division of the narrative, then we also have a mountain. Um, and this one, uh, this is a dragon produced by the uh, heretics. They don't even have six left, do they? Just four. Uh, and this is a Garuda. I think you know. The Garuda picks the dragon to bits. Oh boy, he's getting really bedraggled. He's got an eight o'clock shadow. And in this, in this scene, um, we have a yaksha there, golden-haired yaksha and Vaishravana warrior, protector of Buddhism there, scares him to bits and he begs for mercy. Oh, uh, let me see. There, you can see better what he looks like. Now the manuscript comes to an end. It's just torn off. But we know for sure there was something else. And it's the pièce de résistance of the whole story. I don't know if it's, well, it's torn off. You can see it goes right through 
one of the scenes, but that's, that's on the inside part, on the, you know, a scroll has two sticks, one at the beginning, one at the end. So that the scroll would be wrapped around that at the end. Um, but the last scene is, Rodraksha creates a huge, magnificent tree. And Shariputra conjures up a god of wind. Um, and the god of wind blows down the tree. And that's, that's the climax of this uh, illustrated narrative. And you can see that scene, actually. How do I know it's there? Because the text talks about it. All these manuscripts talk about it. But also, we have this scene painted at the back of many Dunhuang caves in great detail, this, this tree being blown over. And I sh what's very interesting that how does Shaniputra actually produce the wind? He, he produces it with a, a wind god. He conjures up a wind god. And that wind god is really cute. They're actually, I think there are two of them. He's got essentially a bag full of wind under his arm, sort of like a bagpipe player. But it's spewing out wind. That's Aeolus. That figure is, is based on Aeolus. And I wrote about that in uh, my first book, Dunhuang Popular Narratives. It's, it's illustrated in the back of the book in the notes. All right, now we go to, I promised that there would be something for the Southeast Asianists, and I'm going to go real fast. Well, what time did I say would stop? 6.30? Okay. Uh, so the, I'm very proud. I think I got these here at Cornell. I got so much stuff for my research here at Cornell, not, not just looking at the, trends, the uh, microfilms, but pictorial evidence. Because South, Cornell is like number one place for Southeast Asian studies. So they have all these old Dutch journals and everything. And I got this in a, a, a Dutch journal that's over 100 years old. It's very important. Probably, Eric probably knows what this is. Uh, so this guy is called a Dalam. You know, Indonesia has really developed tradition of uh, shadow plays, puppet plays, really elaborate. And they're all called Wayang, uh, which I guess means human figures. Is that right? Human figures? Yeah, anyway. Shadows, maybe. <laughs> Shadows. Uh, so this guy is the performer, the Dalang. He's, look what he's got here. All these scrolls. Picture scrolls. And this particular form is called Wayang Biber. And he puts, you know, they got two sticks. He puts one stick there and he puts one stick here. And he rolls it across. It's like cinema, proto-cinema. It's, I call it, the beginnings of cinema. And there he is, how, that's what it looks like when he has the scroll erected. And he can run it across. Talk about this for a while. And I guess the kids get to sit in back and the adults out front. And there are offerings to the gods. So it's a sacred kind of performance. And it goes on all, all night. I think more than one night. Uh, because he has a lot of scrolls to talk about. And that's the whole scroll unrolled. You can see the kind of stick that it's on. Okay. There's another one unrolled. He never would display it that way when performing. This is for the Dutch anthropologists. <laughs> okay, so uh, I want to say about that kind of performance. They, they also, this, that kind of performance evolved into... Uh, Shadow plays, because the figures on the scroll became detached, right? And they were in leather. Why in kulit? Kulit is leather. And then they can move around. They get detached from the scroll. And also, it's very cool because they put a candle behind the scroll and it flickers. And that, by itself, also gives the sense of movement, animation. Even for the Wayang Beber, that flickering candle does. Oil. Oops, 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 oops. 
So I'm just going to show you very quickly a, a few s examples of uh, using pictures to tell stories. This is Qingming Shanghe Tu, you know, the spring festival by the river. Uh, and people are going out on the street with their picture of their monastery, their temple, begging for money, and they're the group of them. And so they tell stories about the origins of their monastery using this picture. This is a Taoist picture storyteller uh, talking about the skeleton of life. This is, I think, from 13th century. Oh, I should say, for the Wayang, um, most of you have heard of the Chinese, famous Chinese admiral called Zheng He, right? Okay, he had an armada that went all the way to Ceylon and even Western Africa. A Ming admiral. Now, he had a secretary called Ma Huan. Okay, Ma Huan. They were all. They were mostly Muslims. They were mostly, most of the I mean, like Zheng He himself was a Muslim eunuch. Do you know that, Muslim eunuch? And they ship, ship. Uh, I'm going to stop within seven minutes or eight minutes. Okay, and I just got to give you some time for questions and answers. Um, Xing Ma, the, you know, mostly they're Muslims. So, any Ma's here? Yo Yo Ma? <laughs> he was, he is. Okay, so, uh, so there was this very good secretary for Zheng He who kept excellent notes and he published them, he wrote them. And it, oh, I was so thrilled. You know, I discovered most of this stuff up here at Cornell because you have all the books. And all the books are on the shelf. And you have all the right books. So it's good to be here. If you're here, be, you're lucky. Be grateful. So uh, I found this at Cornell. And uh, I also found uh, Ma Huan's uh, diary here. And, and in it, he says, oh, he, he saw this performance. 14th century, I think, 15th century. When, with Zheng He, and he said, oh my, these Indonesians, they have this performance, and he describes this. I'm getting chills telling you this, because he said it is just like Ping Hua back home. How many of you have ever heard of Ping Hua? No? Historians of literature. Okay, Chinese historians of literature. It's a very important part of Chinese literary history. Like after Bian Wen, then you get ping hua. Ping hua means like discursive tale. Um, but he said the Indonesians, the Java, Javanese, they, when they do this thing, he didn't call it wine Vibera. He didn't know what it was called. He just said they, he described it in very great detail. He said, so when he described that as being like ping hua, that filled in a huge gap in Chinese literary history. Because it tells us that Ping Hua were illustrated scrolls. And uh, so far as we have it now, they're just, you know, that kind of Chinese book that has text on the bottom. Text, uh, uh, pictures up on here and text on the bottom. That's what we call Ping Hua in Chinese literary history. But we know from Ma Huan that it was originally this. That's really, really important. I wrote about it maybe 30 years ago, but the scholarly world has not yet caught up with what I did 30 years ago. Hurry up, guys. Okay, this is a Tibetan picture storyteller. She's, what do you call him, Tonka? Yeah. So she's, look, she's got her pointer. She's standing on the street, and she points to different scenes on the Tonka. Probably her little kid, maybe a young, another daughter, an assistant. But you can see it's a woman, and that, it would have been like the Bien storytellers would have been similar, women, on the street. But in China, they could attract crowds of like thousands. We have descriptions. And then, if the government needed soldiers 
to ship off to Yunnan, malarial Yunnan, they just go to one of these bien performances on the street and rope people up and ship them off to the south. They were so popular. It's like TV or movies today. Oh, this I got to go so real fast. Um, this is from the area where the Tokarians lived, Kucha. And it shows... This scene is in three or four places in Xinjiang. Well, anyway, this is the Maya, the mother of the Buddha, giving birth to the Buddha. You can't see it, but the Buddha is coming out of her side. Okay. So on, on this whole scroll, there would be four scenes. I think maybe the next one. Yeah, this is more complete. So here she's down in the bottom right. Can you see a little baby coming out? Let me see. Yeah, there he is. Okay, so uh, let me see. In, then the, there are four scenes, and of course, I, get, I always get mixed up the scene of Buddha getting enlightenment from meditation. Is that the meditation, Dan? Uh, yeah. And this is his preaching the Dharma for the first time. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm turning it wrong way. <laughs> okay, preaching the Dharma, yeah. meditation. And then, of course, that's his nepan, his dying. So the whole idea, why did they, why did some minister of a king, t this was a device to tell the king that the Buddha had died. Because if the, if the minister had just walked in and said, Siddhartha Buddha died, the king probably would have died himself. So he told a story with a picture, picture storytelling of the Buddha's life and death. There are a lot of good reasons to tell stories with pictures. And then this, this shows you that um, in modern India, by the way, this whole technique of picture storytelling, I wrote a book about it called Painting and Performance. It all goes back to India. It's early as like the fourth century. I should, I'm supposed to stay closer to that. I never did. <laughs> okay. Uh, so... I think this is from the 50s, very, very crude painting. Uh, but it's, this storyteller is telling stories about this woman. Maybe this is her daughter, but very simple offerings there. Now I have a student, oh, well, okay. This is in Europe to show that they had picture storytelling there. Uh, these were called Zeitungssänger, newspaper singer, like news singer. Uh, and they had pictures, pictures, and he would tell the news. It's, it was very elaborate in Europe, too, in the fi uh, 15th, 16th, 17th century, storytelling with pictures. Okay, uh, these are the last few. This, uh, the, after Ping Hua, you know, some of you may have heard of a genre called Bao Zhuan. There was a, a great scholar named Daniel Overmeyer who, uh, at Chicago and then UBC who wrote several books about Baldrian, Precious Scrolls. And they, Precious Scrolls, used pictures and storytelling for religious stories, but they were very syncretic. They were very uh, mixed, very popular. And the government didn't particularly like them, neither in the Ming and Qing, definitely not under Mao because Mao confiscated all of them. And I found some of them, you can, somebody asked me a question about this in the question period. What I found about the Baljuan. Please ask me a question. <laughs> okay. So my student, Rostislav Bereskin, a Russian guy, has gone into the countryside in China now and found that the Baljuan tradition has revived after like 40 years of being suppressed by the communists, is coming back. He goes into very little villages and finds they're still doing this. And the, the performers are just farmers. Uh, so it gives us a sense of the social, cultural level. And that's it. Oh. <laughs> the end. <laughs>